so um, so finally we we get to an actual argument related to the to the uh, small ball inequality, and so the theorem will be. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the argument that shows in the, co in the case where the coefficients are identically one in absolute value. If we sum over rectangles, and uh, here I think I need to make, this is, must not be important, but I'm going to assume that the uh, the length of the rectangles in the first coordinate are bigger than minus n over 2, but the volume is fixed, 2 to the negative n. Just with this particular argument, you don't want to run in, there's a degeneracy as, as the size of the rectangles gets too small in one direction. Infinity is bigger than n, 1 plus an eighth. So one is the average case estimate and an eighth is um, the gain over the average case estimate. And uh, the argument I'm going to give is the simplest one that I know that gives a 3D an estimate in three dimensions. Um, we need, uh, I should recall a couple of sort of elementary facts. Uh, sort of known in different languages. One is a paley zygmunt inequality. Uh, there's, so Z, I, uh, I will use probabilistic reasoning. So in particular, conditional expectations will be important. So Z is random variable with mean zero. And um, Let's say that the uh, z to the fourth is less than constant z squared. So then there exists uh, a c prime such that the probability of z being bigger than c prime z2 is bigger than c prime. Uh, so there's various inequalities of this type, but they go under the general rubric of paley zygmunt So if you have control, if the if the fourth moment is controlled by the second moment, the probability the z exceeds a standard deviation bound it exceeds a constant. Um, I also need a, a another sort of basic lemma like this. Um, F sub t are in the point of this uh, lemma is to make get a substitute for the elementary fact that the probability of the intersection of independent events is the product of the probabilities. So we need a, some sort of conditional form of such statement. So, so the, condition, the conditional form will be relative to this increasing sequence of sigma fields. A sub t is event in Ft. And the uh, basic assumption is that the expectation of the indicator of At given Ft minus 1 exceeds gamma. So if the ATs were all independent events, this would be, whole point was, uh, be obvious. So then uh, the probability of the intersection of the indicator of the ATs T equals one to Q exceeds gamma to the Q. Uh, 
Of course, uh, you, you know this if the events are independent, which is the special case that occurs in, in the two-dimensional small ball inequality. So uh, this, this has a, a, a sort of elementary proof. And now, in fact, what I, um, so I, I will, what we in fact need is a weaker assumption Um, we need that the probability of the union from 1 to Q of the conditional expectation of the indicators of these sets, T minus 1, less than gamma, be less than one half gamma to the Q. So in the situation we'll be, we'll be in, we will not be able to get such a, a statement like this almost surely, but rather it will hold on virtually all of the probability space. So it holds aside from an exceptional set that's at most half of the gain that you'd hope to get here. And so then the um, so then then the conclusion is you get the half there. Okay, so uh, the 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 second conclusion takes a little thought to work out. The first conclusion is is just completely elementary. You just you take the conditional expect it's can take conditional expectation once, backwards induction finishes. Uh, the union of the events. Right, the, so you take the union of the events that the conditional expectation um, is too small. If the total union is rather small, less than this one half gamma to the Q, then you still get the conclusion. And this follows, you have to define auxiliary events. It's not, it's not a hard argument. The union of T equals 1 to Q, is that right? Okay. Okay, so this is, the ex this is an extra difficulty which is sort of forced on you in the higher dimensional setting. Okay, so now, um, now, um, we, uh, so we need, we need blocks. So we're, we're so I need some definitions. So let me, we're gonna take, divide, Um, the intervals from 1 to n over 2, n to q, uh, subintervals, i1 up to iq. So, so it should be n over q times t to n over q times t minus 1, intersect the integers. <clears throat> we will have, uh, ultimately take q to be of order n to the 1 fourth, but I'll keep the notation q so that it will be clear where the dependence on n comes in. Okay. 
and then the, the blocks are b sub t, which will be the sum of the a sub r, h sub r, where the first side length of r is in the teeth interval. Okay, so now we, uh, and now what are the, uh, what will the sigma, so, so um, we need basic, Um, now, unfortunately, so I've been sticking with this notation. This is not exactly the notation I like, but I'll stick with it. So now I need to define as associated with B sub T is this term that comes from the fact the rectangles can align. Um, so it's, it's, of, it's a sum of... Um, Rectangles R not equal to S, so R1 equals length of S1 So I, actually, this, this term is the term that comes from the coincidences. I wrote it last time in terms of F sub R and F sub S. This is the equivalent way to write it. So rectangles R and S, which are distinct, so that the, the size of the rectangles in the first coordinate agree and falls in the teeth interval. And so... Um, and so now the, so what we'll show is the probability, well, well, wait a minute, before I do that, I should say we need the basic fact, which is what is the variance bound, standard deviation bound for BT. This needs to be clear. This, um, this is, well, I have N over Q, possibilities for the first coordinate, if I'm thinking parameters, I've got N over Q possibilities for first coordinate by the definition of IT. Second coordinate, I have N choices. So there's a standard deviation bound. So this is N over square root of Q. So now what we'll show is the probability of the intersection from one to Q of BT bigger than a small constant, tau, small but absolute, N over square root of Q is positive. In fact, the, the in fact, we, we, we will get a, a constant gamma to the Q here, which is exactly what one would expect from Gaussian behavior. So again, the, the rationale is that the probability of this event is typically a constant, at least a half. So under independence, the probability of this event will be bigger than two to the negative Q. And in fact, we can prove a bound of that type. But the fact that we take the blocks, we don't take n blocks, but only this much smaller number q of order n to the one fourth is used in an essential way. So, what, what else do we need to know here? Well, we, we definitely need to know that if I take so we need some sort of proposition. Uh, we should define um, 
f sub t equals a sigma field in the first coordinate of dyadic intervals of length 2 to the negative. Well, I want Bt to be Ft measurable. So I, I should take n t plus 1 over q. So it's, it's, it's an important complication that the sigma field's only in the first coordinate. And we still have to deal with these as random variables in, in three coordinates and which complication will enter the proof. And then there's a, a proposition um, which, how, how, how shall I state this? Proposition will state that if I condition on Ft that I know what I'm getting. So if I if I take if I take now I should really but revert back to my F sub R's. F sub R is the sum of R such that Rj is two to the minus Rj. A sub R, H sub R. And let's say that R1 is in the teeth coordinate. And then, and consider the expectation of FR given FT minus one. So that is, so the meaning here is you, this is, you take a dyadic interval here and you sort of renormalize the probability space so that you only see that, that dyadic interval in the first coordinate keep, and keep the other two the same, then this, it's, uh, an, we should notice that this is, has the distribution of F of R2, R3, and the first coordinate, R1, minus that, that number right, uh, minus the relevant number. The fact that you condition on this interval has the effect of reducing the first coordinate by a fixed amount and leaving the other two coordinates unchanged. In particular, when we, if we condition on one of the sigma fields, we don't, we're not changing the underlying random variables in any substantive way. All of our standard deviation bounds, et cetera, all of our, our moment inequalities and so on will all apply. So an elementary proposition, but it, seem, it, one, it seems to be that one needs to restate it. And so now the, we, we're still collecting standard facts of the construction. And if S of Bt squared, this would be the square function of Bt in x1, okay, is, and this was a, a, an important calculation that motivated our, the analysis of a, a, this when a rectangle is a line, uh, and this is, this is basic, has a leading dominant term n squared over q, 
again, constant. Square functions, functions that are constant are very good. They, they, ha they have the nicest behavior, as close to Gaussian as you can get. Plus this gamma t. And likewise, if you take where the gamma t is, is the part when you square out the square function and uh, you don't get a constant. So let me, T. so the calculation, just to summarize it, the calculation, is the square function of bt in the first, in x1 coordinate is explicitly, you sum a in the tth interval where of all r's, such that the first coordinate is this specific value in the tth interval squared. Squaring this out, you get, you get an fr times an fs. When they agree, that's the constant term. When they disagree, that's the term for which we have the better estimate. So that generically, the non-constant term in the square function is smaller. And in the same way, if we take S, BT relative, the square function of BT relative to the sigma field FT minus one squared, we get C N squared over Q plus the conditional expectation of this other term. <clears throat> now, here is a theorem, here's the theorem that we need. X L two thirds is less than um, N over square root of Q, N squared over Q. So the argument that I gave yesterday approved this estimate. Well, it didn't give two thirds, but uh, a related exponent, and it, and it was in the case where Q is in, and so we got the end of the three halves. And and so again, the rash, so that that same argument, if you work through it, will will give this estimate, an estimate of this type. And the rationale is as follows. You have one free parameter here, and it has n over q possible values. Oh, wait a second. 3n squared over q into the 3. 3n squared over 2 and 3. So I've got... n squared, so I get three halves, n squared over the square root of q, three halves, three, three. A second, why am I blanking on this? I can always blame the food. I have my notes up here, so let me just.
Well, this rationale says it has to be three halves over Q, and I believe that should be right. Then, I, then the, the notes that I made this morning, I left in my hotel room, and then I can't find them. n to the 3 halves over the square root of q. I believe that's correct. The rationale is that the parameters in this, in the three-dimensional case, everything will work as expected, that you have three free parameters, and so you, you would, the estimate you expect is the product of the parameter square root, which is the n to the 3 halves over square root of q. And then the argument that I gave last time will not give the two-thirds, it'll give two-fifths instead. Uh, the the two-thirds follows by a more delicate case analysis. Okay. So that's, and I think the, the last thing that we need to just make sure that we remember is the Littlewood-Paley inequalities. which say, remember that I'm, I'm going to appeal to the paley zygman which says that I need to deal with a random, I'm working with a random variable that has mean zero, and the second moment and the fourth moment are comparable. So, with, so we just need to remember that um, In fact, I need to condition, if I take the fourth moment of this to the one-fourth, this is going to be comparable to, um, <clears throat> well, it's going to be comparable to the, uh, the Littlewood-Paley, the expectation of S um, BT, given f t minus 1 that's what the littlewood paley inequalities will tell me and notice again this is a conditional statement and uh, uh, i'm this is i need to take this squared um So the, the, the correct statement is this, squared f t minus 1 to the 1 half. <clears throat> and then given the, uh, since we know what the uh, square function is, it's this dominant term n over square root of q. n squared over q plus this expectation of gamma t given f t minus 1 squared to the one-half. <clears throat> and now this is typically much smaller, n to the three-halves over square root of q. So the, the difference between this and this is on the order of a square root of n. So 
Typically, this is going to be the smaller term, which means that this dominates both the second moment and the fourth moment, which is the condition you need for the paley zygman inequality. So here, both the analysis of the coincidence and the simple term, along with the little wood paley inequalities, are helping you to control the second and fourth moments. So, so, and we, so I think we have all the elements together, but, in, but because of the complexity of the three-dimensional situation, it's a little complicated to, to state everything. To state, so if we could find x2, x3, so that For all t, the expectation in x1 of gamma t squared given f t minus 1 to the 1 half was less than a small constant eta times the dominant term we would be done. Because then we would be in a position to apply our simple lemma about um, <clears throat> that's not, I should take square root of this. So if the conditional second moment of these things for fixed x2 and x3 uniformly satisfied this in the x1 coordinate, namely being much smaller than the standard deviation term, then you're, you're, you're in a position to apply paley zygmunt to say the second and fourth moments and the x1 coordinate of b sub t are comparable. It obviously has mean zero, so paley zygmunt says you exceed standard deviation with a fixed constant. The statement holds conditionally, so you get to apply the simple version of the earlier proposition, you're finished. But of course, this is far too optimistic. And so instead, what you finished and so instead, what you have to consider is the bad exceptional set so this is ex this is, this is a bad set, an exceptional set it's a function it lives in the x two x three coordinates. And it, to test whether or not x2 and x3 are in the set, you have to take a probability in the x1 coordinate of a union bound where the conditional, where that previous conditional statement doesn't hold. expectation over uh, conditional expectation of this gamma t squared given f t minus 1 to the 1 half is bigger than an eta n over square root of q. And what did that more complicated proposition require? It required that, that such probability, so we're, whoops.
we're trying to apply this lemma under this assumption. So we need this, this we need a, the probab and here the, the assumption was the probability of the union of the sets where the conditional expectations were bad exceeded no more than half of the bound that you ultimately wanted. So at the very end, so here, what is playing the role of the conditional expectation being bad? Well, it's the, con it's the conditional expectation of this bad variance term being too large. If that's the case, I get no control over the second and fourth moments. And then this should be no more than, than uh, some gamma to the Q So then if the probability of E, and this is an X2, X3, is less than one, we're done. For, because you choose X2 and X3 not in this set, and then you can run the conditional expectation argument to prove the inequality. Now, fortunately, this uh, so. Uh, fortunately, this this even though it has a somewhat complicated definition, one can nevertheless simply use Chebyshev and trivial union bounds to estimate it. And so that's what we're going to do. So, in particular, use Chebyshev, and you throw a gamma to the negative gamma is small numbers. You throw a gamma to the negative q out front. Take expectation here, and this is expectation of the whole thing. And so the probability of this is probability in X2, X3 of E is less than a gamma to the negative Q. Uh, we had a, union, a probability of a union. I'm just going to use the sum bound on the union, 1 to Q over 2. of the probability of this conditional expectation eta n squared over q which is less than q gamma to the negative q and now for this last probability, we have uh, exponential moments for that term. Now I stated the exponential moments for um, for this pi t, but they hold for the conditional expectation squared as well. And so you get a minus something to the two-thirds, and what do you get? You get an eta n squared over q. Uh, you get that term, and now the n to the three halves over square root of q. And so this, this is q gamma to the negative q x minus eta to the two-thirds. You have n to the three-halves inside of two-thirds. I'm sorry, let's combine powers of n. I've got n to the one-half inside of two-thirds. That leaves me a one-third, and the same for q. So I've got an n over q to the one-third. So now it, it just remains to figure out how big I can take Q, and it's clear that I should uh, choose Q so that it's about the same order as N over Q 
to the one-third. And now that says that Q is basically N to the one-fourth, and the gain over average case is square root of Q N to the one-eighth. This argument is both the simplest and the best that I'm aware of. So I want to give us, as a last speaker, um, sort of have to give a special thanks to the organizers for including me in part of this illustrious series. I want to thank everyone else, old friends and new, for making the effort to come. Thanks.